different than the rest. The reason this one is on um, slides is because I wanted to show some pictures. In any case, before we start, it will be useful to ask if you if you have any questions on the whatever previous material. There are no questions. Okay, so let us start with this. So in the last several lectures, I have introduced a fairly large number of the order of 10 or so different models of self-organized criticality. And all of these are simple models. And these are supposed to be models of these complex systems. After all, the school is about complex systems. And uh, so, you know, the this is the title. And it sounds a little bit of an oxymoron or self-contradiction or whatever you like. And that is a standard objection raised against such models. It says these models are too simple. And that is sort of supposed to be a dismissive comment about them. And the first part of this presentation is sort of a justification for this approach to study these models. Okay, it needs a little bit of justification because the people who complain are not stupid people. They are actually professors in some place or the other or some such thing. <laughs> and so you have to take the objection seriously. You have to understand it. And you have to also realize that the rejoinder is also a serious argument. It is not a random comment. You know, you just say, no, 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 this is like this. You think about it yourself. You might be even convinced that these arguments are actually right. You have to decide for yourself. Some people will think, no, 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 these are not simple enough. Or some people will say these are too simple. They are not useful enough or they are useful. And uh, judgment can vary a little bit about this, you know. Uh, but anyway, let me go on. So it works anywhere. OK. So this is sort of the general preamble. It says that the phenomena we study in physics is very large. Distances are from 10 to the power minus 35 meters to 10 to the power 20 meters, 27 meters. And time scales go from 10 to the power minus 43 to billions of years. And that's a huge range. And a uh, lot of people study these problems at the ends of the range. So they study either the some things which are very, very small, you know, at Planck length, or they study things are very, very big, which is the size of the universe. In particular, amongst Indian students, there is a very great fascination with studying either the things which are very small or very big. And everything else doesn't sound to be sufficiently interesting. Okay, So, you know, astronomy or cosmology or particle physics, these are the only subjects they want to study. And this one is a, it's a sort of advertisement for the subject. And so I'm justifying the fact that there is interest outside the ultra big and ultra small. Okay, So there are many interesting not understood phenomena at human scales, the kinds of questions you encounter in everyday life. One should look at them, one should be surprised at them, one should un try to understand why they happen. And not only try to understand why um, something at Planck length scale happens, you know, I don't even know how it happens. Uh, this is sort of not exactly the point, but you know, I, I actually remember it very well because Abdul Salam, when he had visited Tata Institute, he once told us this story. So he said, you know, he was from Jhang, which is sort of near Lahore, small city near Lahore. And he said there was a professor of a college in Lahore, and he was telling students, you know, there are all these fundamental forces. Uh, all of us know about gravity. 
Now, there is also electricity in Lahore, and the weak and strong interactions only occur in CERN in Europe. No, so <laughs> it's sort of, uh, of course, you know, Salam knew, knows that the, um, things occur everywhere, but it's a question of uh, what you find interesting and what is relevant at any given time. And uh, so, anyway, let us go on. So my aim here is to illustrate how simple models can help understand complex phenomena. You are welcome to interrupt at any time. Okay, so this is a complex phenomena, crack, crack patterns in mud, Kutch region, and photo is taken from the, in oh. Okay, uh, I think the resolution is not great, but um, I should have been more careful in, you know, transcribing one file from another place to another place, but anyway. Uh, you get the picture. Uh, this is the catchment area of Ganga River and the major tributaries. And you see these river networks. And they have interesting structure. And can we understand that? We have discussed it a little bit, but this is sort of um, more colloquial presentation. Uh, so catchment areas of river basins, can we understand the why the river network looks the way it does. Okay, these are sand dunes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay. So this is a quotation from Feynman <coughs> Lectures in Physics Volume 1, Lecture 1. So it, there is a long preamble, he says that if I were to ask, I think all of you have seen this one, but I am reminding you. He tells the story of you are supposed to pick out one sentence from the whole of physics and encapsulate the basic understanding, which is the only thing which will be conveyed to future generations. Then what is it? That's the question. And his answer is this one. He says, all things are made of atoms, little particles that move around in perpetual motion. Please note that he doesn't say h psi equal to e psi. Okay? He has not picked the um, general relativity equation either, you know, r mu nu equal to t mu nu or whatever. <laughs> so, I showed this in, in TIFR and some of my particle physics friends were incensed, but since it was said by Feynman, they had nothing to say. <laughs> they were quiet. But they said, we don't agree. We don't agree with Feynman. You are welcome to disagree. But you know, he was sort of not so unwise a person and he thought about it and this is what he came up with. Okay? All right. So from atoms, you can make big, big, bigger structures, molecules, that, that is like chemistry, macromolecules like DNA, living cells, animals, societies of animals, and these are structures at bigger scale. And people study all these things. So, but when they study these different subjects, they usually study in different departments. So, you know, the atoms are perhaps studied in physics departments, molecules in chemistry, you know, there is chemistry, and then there is biology, and uh, psychology is the, mental processes in individuals and the sociology when you lot of people get together that is the subject of sociology and ecology is interacting lots of many different societies different species of animals and at each level of organization new principles emerge which are you won't even get an idea that they are there if you are just studying atoms you have no meaning. The word life has no meaning in itself. Because atoms are just, you know, like that. There is nothing much to discuss. But life has a lot of interesting properties and people like to understand it. And it's, it's different. Um, then, and there is this thing called love. And it is, no, I'm not making a joke. I'm making a point. 
the point is this, I guess it is very hard to imagine bacteria as loving each other. There is no notion of love in bacteria. But if you go to animals like birds, then you can kind of agree that birds love their mates, you know, they, they form bonds, they stay with their mates forever, for, for their lifetime. And if one of them is separated, the other one seems to be somewhat sad from a behavior. You can see the behavior. So you can see that love does emerge in animals, but not in bacteria. It is a higher function which emerges only at a later stage of evolution. Okay? And then, so if you look at parrots or some birds like this, they perhaps they love, but then they do not have a notion of culture. They do not write papers in PRL for sure. Okay? No, so the, this culture phenomena, which their culture is the same, you know, they, they, they behave in some way, but the behavior is the same now as it was 2000 years ago, maybe 10,000 years ago. And so, not too much cultural evolution occurs even in these animals, which are somewhat sophisticated forms of animals. So, if you are studying cultural phenomena, you have to go beyond biology. You will not be able, if you think of all animals or you think of human beings just as animals, it will not, you will not be able to make much progress towards the cultural evolution. Okay? You need totally different ideas and the words which people discuss these things in terms of are new words which are not used in biology much, in rest of biology much. Okay? So, these things are called emergent properties. All these life, love and culture, these are all emergent properties. Okay? So, now we want to understand these emergent properties and how do they come out? That is called self-organization. Because nobody is putting them in, they somehow come out by themselves. How did the birds get into being from bacteria? I am not very sure. Somehow it happened. Okay? So, that is called self-organization. Okay? And we want to understand this emergence in self-organization as a sort of generic phenomena and uh, how to do it. So, it is not immediately clear that if you want to understand cultural phenomena, you will be able to do it from sand pile models. Okay? But I am saying in general one expects that statistical physics deals with systems with many degrees of freedom which interact with each other. And so, if we have some experience with understanding how interacting systems which interact with each other behave, then maybe we have some edge over other people who do not have that experience inside, you know, they have not dealt with these topics before. Okay? So, you may or you may not like the sand pile model, but this fact that statistical physics is hopefully useful in understanding sand should not be so much under dispute. Okay? Then if you do not like this particular stuff, you can always modify and study something else, you know, you modify the model, make, make a change here, make a change there. Okay? So, those are details. So, it says may help in understanding this. Of course, somebody will say that you, this is just a hope, you have no proof that this actually happens. Okay? In fact, you cannot give me a good example where this happens. And so, I gave some examples and they said this is not good enough, this is not good enough. <laughs> okay? So, this, this again is a contentious issue, you can think about it and you may come up with an answer which is not always yes, but at least my belief is that we should try. I think we may work, it may help. Other people have tried other things, some of them worked, some of them did not work, but you know, there is no harm trying at the very least. Okay? Very good. Uh, so, this is the importance of simple models. 
So I start with this quote from Einstein. It says, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. I think I mentioned it earlier, that I don't think I agree with this point. Because if you have a complex system, uh, you are not able to keep it as simple as, you cannot, you, you have to simplify extra, otherwise you will not make any progress. Okay? So, there is a definition of what is a complex system. So, it says, uh, this is my definition I cooked up, it says, cannot be described in terms of few variables. If you need to describe it in terms of 10 variables, I think it is complex because my head kind of spins and I cannot really understand 10 variables at a time. Okay? But two or three variables, I think I can understand. So, if you take a box of gas in equilibrium, it can be specified in terms of two or three numbers. This is a nitrogen gas at room temperature, pressure, the volume is so much. You tell me these many three things, Com composition and the pressure and temperature and then I more or less I know everything about it. It is fully specified. The behavior of the system is fa fairly well understood or specified at least. In, I do not know about understood, but at least for specification of the system, I only need to give you two variables. So, it is simple. But if you take the same box of gas and stir it up a little bit and I want to describe the same box of gas, then I have to describe it using the, here the velocity is this much, here the velocity is this much, here the velocity is this much in this kind of description and that is much harder and requires many more variables. You have to give velocity as a field, density as a field, temperature as a field everywhere. Okay? Then the system becomes complex. Okay. So, this, um, so then, it, so we are going to try to discuss complex systems, but we want to deliberately ignore many details of the system and simplify further. And uh, this one I put in red, it says ignoring unimportant details is the core of understanding. Okay. So, I would like to explain it from a story. I was trying to tell one friend of mine, he was a film director and I was telling, oh yeah, we are studying models of rivers. And he said, how can you make a model of a river? Every river is different from every other. Mahanadi river is different from Brahmaputra. So, I said, yeah, of course. You know, he grew up near Mahanadi and he was very fond of the river in some way. He has emotional attachment to the river. But I was saying, oh, but it's a river, it's just a river. No? <laughs> so, so, suppose you are a medical doctor and a patient comes to you. I have a stomach ache. So, you say, oh, okay, what did you eat yesterday? Then you take these two pills, go home, you will be okay. You do not need to know what color of shirt he was wearing yesterday, did he have a fight with his wife or some such thing. All these things are there they perhaps even affect the digestion system sometimes in some way, right? It is possible, you know, if, if you have anxiety, it causes stomach problems, it is known. But at the first approximation, I do not have to worry about all this. Most medical doctors will not ask, ask about how many fights did you have with your wife, no, and just to treat a medi stomach ache, right? So, we are taking that position. And the fact that the medical doctor knows that I should ask what did you eat yesterday and not ask what color of shirt you were wearing yesterday or even bother about the color of shirt you are wearing today. Does your name start with an S or with an O or whatever? <coughs> uh, this is a understanding of the problem. The problem is a stomach ache and the name has nothing to do with it, right? So, I do not ask about the name. So, those details I am ignoring and that shows some core of understanding. So, we are trying to keep some basic phen phenomena which are core to understanding and then I ans try to answer the question at hand. Of course, you know if I ignore a crucial detail, if I only ask that did you visit the temple yesterday or not and if you did not visit then that is the reason for the stomach ache, maybe there will be a problem. So, if you do not identify the core 
issues correctly, then of course you are not making a right model, you are not describing it right. But if you are ignoring other things which we call irrelevant, then maybe we are doing it right. So, I do not make any apologies for ignoring several details in the kinds of things we discuss. Okay, so, this is illustrated with some examples. So, this is fragmentation process. I think we did not discuss, we discussed it very vaguely, but I thought I will do it in some more detail here. So, fragmentation is a very important engineering phenomena from because lot of processes which occur in industry like mining, you have to you know pull out lot of stuff, you have to break lot of rock, milling involve breakage of large material of matter, rock and into smaller pieces and lot of energy is spent in doing this. And if you can sort of reduce the amount of energy spent, then you are making great help in our industrial processes. Sometimes we, you know, so in mining we want to actually break. Sometimes we do not want to break, you know, like um, airplanes, we do not the wings to come off when I am travelling at least, right. So, strength of materials, um, cement, you do not want the buildings to fall or cement to develop cracks. When, you, know, you, you have to understand the fragmentation process, how it occurs in order to avoid it occurring. Uh, then there are these things like earthquakes where this, I do not hope to change the earth usually. You know, in the cement, I hope to make a new cement where the um, thing will break less often. In the case of earthquakes, I do not really have some such hope. I am not going to engineer the new earth which does not have quakes. The only thing I can do is to sort of mitigate the effect or predict the earthquake or some such thing. Okay? Um, then there are these things, environmental studies. You have to have study the erosion of rocks, polar ice melting. And uh, again, here you have to, these things happen, that is known. We are not even trying to control them just now but we are hoping to predict how much of it will occur in the next 10 years or some such thing. Okay? So, even uh, trying to estimate the rate at which these processes occur is all that I hope to get sometimes in some of these complex problems. Okay? So, in particular in fragmentation process there has been a lot of work and usually the work involves in saying something like this that there is a big rock it is undergoes some protocol of breaking, poof, poof, you hit it at various places, then it becomes smaller rocks, then you hit the smaller pieces in some way, they become smaller rocks and eventually you get a distribution of pebbles of various sizes. Some are very tiny dust, some are very big and can we understand the distribution of sizes of fragments. It spe specializes the problem into some sub problem but that is the one which we are trying to understand. And it is expected or hoped that this fragment size distribution may be independent of material details. You know whether you are breaking a rock of sulphur or an igneous rock or something some, uh, some other thing. It may be the kind of distribution of sizes of fragments you get does not depend on the deep material you are processing. And, uh, at least for a class of processing proto protocols. No, not for every possible thing, but for a class of such protocols. Okay? I think all these um, uh, caveats have to be remembered in a real application. Okay? And it is no use saying your theory is no good because it correct, does not correctly tell me this because maybe it tells some other things which are useful and it is ok, it is not telling me this, but you know that is not the only question which you need ask, but you should be aware of the questions we are trying to answer. If there is no question we are trying to answer, then you have not thought enough about the question. Okay. 
so here this was sort of our my um, start in this term so there was a paper in uh, geoscience about glaciers and uh, 2014 november and they said that Calvin Glacier is a self-organized critical system. So I described this to you last time, I think. But the picture was not there. So this is a sheet of ice, and uh, it cracks, and cracks fall into the sea. And uh, this is what it says here. Mm. Ah, yeah. So, uh, over the next century, one of the largest contributions to civil rise will come from ice sheets and glaciers calving into the ocean. Factors controlling the rapid and non-linear variables in calving fluxes are poorly understood. Here we analyze globally distributed data set, something, something. We find that calving events introduced by brittle fracture of glacier ice are governed by the same power law distribution as in the sand pile model. So, you know, since it said the sand pile model, I tried to look at the paper a little bit closer and uh, so so this is um, inspired by the work of Estrom et al and breaking up of glacial ice so we take a square and so this is uh, like this it's a square grid of um, so it's discrete ice space and uh, cracks are orient initiated on the left end and move right with constant velocity, random transverse displacement and finite splitting probability. <coughs> so, crack starts on one end and it propagates to the right, but as it propagates to the right, it also diffuses in the transverse direction. Sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down. In our case, we just assume it goes up and down with equal probability. Okay, and sometimes it can split. One crack can become two cracks with some probability, which right now we will say is independent of the position. And then if two cracks come together, they just merge and they go on like this. And so there is a single parameter lambda here, which is the split probability, which determines the evolution. Yes? Uh, so if the two cracks come, they merge and move as a single crack. This model was studied by other people before as a model of aggregation, disaggregation. So, what people had studied in the past was actually exactly this model, but they never produced this picture. What they were doing was studying a one-dimensional line in which there are particles which move around, like the Takayashu model of sorts. Particles can move around, they can diffuse and they can merge with some rates specified, but it was thought of as a one-dimensional process evolving in time. So, the kinds of things they looked at was only the mass distribution of sizes or some such thing, but they did not look at the shape of cracks, because the shape of cracks is a, and this is in the time history. And that is a non, a, not a reasonable, not an obvious variable in the problem where you think of time evolution of a, um, some one dimensional model of aggregation. <coughs> okay? So, we wanted to look at it a, as a process which produces. So, these cracks form and they develop and they go away in the wake behind, they leave behind a set of fragments. And we are looking at the distribution of sizes of these fragments. Okay, and this is the picture of a simulation result um, with some rates and you know some details are there and you see this is the kind of structure which you get in this model. This comes in the steady state and even if you start with one crack, it will break into two cracks, they will uh, separate from each other with time, if then the two will become four and so on. So, eventually you get a unique steady state. If you start with too many cracks, the number of they will merge and they will get to a same density. So, the steady state is unique, it depends only on lambda and then you can ask what is the steady state distribution of these cracks in the steady state. Okay? And uh, these are the pictures from real glaciers. So, you see there are crack patterns. Sorry. 
this cracks. It, so the model may not be perfect, you know, but it is catching some basic phenomena which is there. It is not fully um, unreasonable. No, no, no. One has to be sure of the claim made. And uh, so this is what it is. Um, and uh, it was not easy to get these pictures because we don't get um, these journals in physics libraries usually. But anyway, um, managed to get them. Yes? What was the variation for the distribution? Uh, Lambda, which was the split probability. Okay. okay. The steady state distribution of fragment sizes. This is a little bit of a technical detail. The rates of breaking and merging. There is a rate to break and the rate to merge is one. But the ratio defines some chemical potential. And there is a detailed balance corresponding to non-interacting Hamiltonian. H steady state is equal to minus mu summation n i. n i is the occupation number variable at bond i. You have to check this point. But once you check this point, then it's clear what is the steady state distribution. It's an independent occupation of different sites. But again, the independent distribution of different sites sounds like a um, rather trivial distribution. But buried inside it is somewhere the distribution of fragment sizes which is less obvious. Okay? So, this is the statement here. Each fragment is a region bounded by two bias directed rocks. And these two, so maybe I should go back to that picture again, two bias random rocks. So, this rock goes like this, this rock goes like this. When the two sides merge, then that is the end of the fragment. The reason the rocks have now become biased is because if you look at the left end, then it's likely to move to the right. If I look at a fragment and I look at the left end, whenever a split occurs, then I'm moving to the right because I keep the left end of my fragment, which is the right end of the worker. So I move, move to the right more often to the left. So these become biased workers. Okay. So many results are known. So the scaling distribution for these kinds of stuff is, sorry. So this is called uh, staircase polygons, area under a Brownian bridge, and so on. Has been yes, please. Yeah, but there is a probability to break into two. When you break into two, I keep the right end, okay. which makes it biased. Okay. So then you get a distribution like that, and probability goes like um, you can show this result. I will not go into details. There is a function g that is called some airy function. And um, it's a special function, you know, but has been worked out by Airy, which also is interesting because Airy, you know, what did he have to do with um, either sand piles or with um, glaciers? No, it comes up in uh, some diffusion problem. He was doing some optics problem. And he come up with this Airy distribution in this optics problem. And so, you know, the mathematics is the same. You get the same Airy distribution even in this new problem. Okay. I don't know how many of you have heard the name Airy. Everybody has heard. In some book or the other, the name occurs. Okay. It's, uh, he was studying diffra diffraction stuff. Okay. So, seg segment, uh, this summary of fragmentation modeling, we discussed a simple model of fragmentation of propagating, branching, merging cracks. Here, the relative frequencies of different fragment shapes can be exactly determined. <coughs> and uh, there is some qualitative agreement with observations of glaciers. So I was, you know, I was trying to argue with this, you know, so I was asking these people who make um, pictures of glaciers. They said, no, 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 you know, it is very hard to estimate the size of a glacier because glacier has a these cracks which you can see from top from satellites you can take photographs that's easy but they also have a depth which is much harder to monitor it's and so what matters in the end is you know whether it um, the volume of the 
uh, fragment, not the area of the fragment and the volume is a much more complicated variable, so we cannot really predict very well, which is true. So, you know, you, you realize there was a model, there was some interesting stuff. Um, this model has some interesting properties, which let me say here. So, I will ask that, okay, there is this shape. What is the probability that this particular shake occurs somewhere in my big fragmented sheet? I can determine this number. And then there is this other shape, which also occurs with some probability, okay, which I can determine again. But then I can ask that what is the probability that this occurs and this also occurs? So it turns out very in interestingly. So, I can say that something here and something here, starting here, this cluster is of type C, this cluster is of type C prime. Is there a correlation between these two events of the shapes? Are the shapes of the cracks correlated? And interestingly, the answer is that the shapes are totally uncorrelated unless they are touching which is very strange because of course, in the actual problem, there is a huge correlation. They share a common boundary. So, the shapes are not independent, but the shapes are nearly independent unless they are actually touching. And there is a proof of course, which we will not give just now. You can look up the paper. Okay. <coughs> ah, so, this is the second problem I want to discuss river networks. So, rivers have been cradles of human civilization and very important determinant of our environment. Nowadays, there is a lot of pollution and that causes a lot of problems to people even now. Uh, so, of course, there are more spectacular rivers. This is the Amazon river with all its tributaries and the colors are just distance from the um, last end point. Okay, so, um, okay, this is a nice picture and that was in previous picture was also nice, but is there some common features in these rivers? Can we predict the structure of a network um, knowing only the geological structure? If I give you, you know, if I do not tell you anything, then of course, it is very hard to predict the structure of the river network. But suppose I tell you, oh, I know South America, there is this kind of rock here, there is this kind of rock here, there is this kind of elevation here, this kind of elevation here, then can I predict the river network? The answer is that this is also not very good because the network evolves in time. Rivers actually are known to evolve substantially within 1000 years time scale, while the geological processes are perhaps a little bit on a longer time scale. So, the geological structure does not uniquely determine the river network. Okay. Um, so, we modify the question. Are there some general properties of such networks independent of details of geography, same for different river basins? Okay. And so, this is some phenomenology. Rivers have been studied by geologists and hydrologists for a long time. They are also called, there are also other drainage supply networks, blood circulation network in animals, which are similar in structure. And uh, most of the maps show only major rivers or the big rivers. For a hydrologist, rivers are space filling trees, because from every point there has to be an outward flow. Okay. And network may consist of thousands of rivers. So, this is the Strahler uh, ranking of rivers in a network. This was also designed by hydrologists. Starting river has rank 1. When two rivers of same rank join, the resulting stream has rank R plus 1. If a river joins to a river of lower rank, then its rank does not change. But if two rivers of same rank join, then the mm, 
joint river has a rank which is one higher that is the definition. So, here all these n leaf nodes have rank 1, these two join 1 to form river of rank 2, 2 joins to 1 it is still 2, but these here these 2 and 2 join that becomes 3 and 3 joins to 2 remains 3, 3, 3, but it, and it goes on. You know. In this case the lowest river is only rank 3. Okay. So, there are phenomenological laws which is Horton's law number of streams of rank r divided by number of streams, streams of rank r plus 1 is nearly a constant and Hex law it says length of longest river upstream river is area of catchment to the power a, but a is not 0.5 this is length this is area you might expect that this power is half, but it is not half it is 0.6 is clearly different from half and can we understand these points, can we derive these laws from more basic physical principles, okay, that is the kind of question we like to ask. And so, this is the Scheidegger model which I have already described actually, but let me repeat because there is no harm. It says discretized square grid, uniformly sloping landscape, uniform annual rainfall, no loss of water by evaporation seepage, all rain water goes to the sea. At each grid point, the, the direction of the outflow is down left or down right with equal probability. So, flowing rivers, uh, flowing water from small rivulets that join to form bigger streams and bigger streams and we ignore the bifurcation of rivers. So, you know the, from each point there is only one exit direction and this is a typical picture. Okay, so, uh, Scheidegger river network is a directed random spanning tree on a lattice <laughs> and the catchment basins of segments are staircase polygons back to the same um, issue. Many average properties of large networks are easy to calculate. So, one can show that if you pick a site at random fractional number of sites with the outflow f goes like f to the power minus 4 by 3 for large L, fractional number of sites with longest upstream path of length L goes like this power. So, you go to a site, is what is the probability that if I keep on going to the longest upstream, how far can I go? And that is a power law with that power and can we understand these laws and all these laws previously discussed are obeyed with A equal to 2 by 3 in this model. Okay, so, summary of this discussion. <coughs> simple model of river networks is the Scheidegger model. In this model catchment basins are staircase polygons and we can determine the relative frequencies of different shapes and then we say the model may not be very realistic, but does help understand the origin of the observed regularities. Okay. So, when the initially the hydrologists posed the model there was a big mystery, why is there this Hex law, why is there this Horton's law, we have no clue. At least I think at that time they did not have a very clear idea why this happens. But once you have a model like this, then you understand the origin of the law in somewhat more um, basic level. And if it turns out that you know the real network is not exactly like this one, Scheidegger. So, then I just say that oh well you know the in the real network like in the Ganga rivers they slope down then it goes like that, then it goes like that. Maybe the flow down is not everywhere in the same direction. So, I will make a more detailed model in which the flow um, there will be a more complicated profile of the slope of the land and that will give me a better picture or better agreement with observed data. Okay. Um, okay, so right now that is the end of this one. Um, now, escape and um, sorry, I do not know how to operate this one. Can, oh, there is a mouse.
Okay, and then, then we go to this one. And full screen, F5. Ah, this didn't work. Control F5. Ah, control L. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is a different problem, which I thought I will discuss. So it is uh, modeling proportionate growth. So this work is done with large number of people, and I'm only citing the main collaborators. <laughs> Starts in 2002, which is long time ago. Okay. This was a student from Lausanne who spent six months in TIFR. Then S.B. Singha and Samarth Chandra, Deep Sadhu, Rahul Dandekar. Okay, so why is this problem, in, what is the problem and why is it interesting? This is what I will explain to you. So the, my interest in this problem comes from different perspectives. <coughs> there is some biological interest in the problem because it describes growth of animals. There is also some physics interest, which is pattern formation. You know, so you study different kinds of patterns and why do some patterns develop. And there is some interesting mathematics which occurs, discrete harmonic functions and tropical polynomials. And uh, I'll try to give a general idea of these, but maybe not great discussion. So growth in biological systems. Different body parts in animals grow at roughly the same rate. This is well-known phenomena. And he's shown me this picture. Okay, and uh, I would say that this is very surprising and interesting and unexpected. And can we understand why how this happens? Proportionate growth is typical in animal kingdom. It is less obvious in plants and trees. By looking at a tree's height. The small trees don't look the same as big trees. There is substantial difference. Just by looking at the tree, you can tell how tall it is. Looking at a picture of a tree, sometimes, quite often, you can tell that um, how big it is. Okay, but the reason this problem is interesting for me is that this problem is much easier than the development of an animal from a single cell. There has been a lot of study of development, you know, there is a whole subject called development biology. But the problem they study is precisely this, you know, how does a single egg become a chicken? And that involves very complicated stuff, you know, you have to, um, it's called morphogenesis, which is generation of shapes. And uh, some part, there is a spherical shell, which has to become, some part has to become the head, some part has to become the tail, and then feathers have to come, and all these kinds of stuff. It's very complicated. And it is not well understood, whatever the biologists claim. <coughs> so I would say that let us consider a simpler problem. You have a baby chicken. All the uh, body organs are formed, and they just make a bigger chicken. Okay? So how does this happen? Okay, and uh, so let me explain the point. The point is this, uh, so the, I have a hand. Um, there are these fingers. Baby has a hand which is smaller and they grow. How come this finger grows at the same rate as this finger? Because they are not talking to each other. And as the system evolves, the different parts grow independently. Then usually you expect uh, noise to grow or become bigger with time, okay? But it seems that it doesn't uh, seem to, uh, even at 60 years of age, the, you know, the, some cells from the end keep on dying and they are replaced by new cells and so on <coughs> and so forth. But the proportional, uh, proportion of the lengths of the fingers remains constant for most people, which requires some amount of control. Something else is controlling the fact that the fingers remain of the same size. It cannot be totally independent growth. That control is hard to 
visualize clearly. That's what we are kind of looking at. How come, what decides that these things grow at the same rate? Okay. Also, so the mo we developed some models, but all these models are, and there have been a lot of models of growth in which have been studied in physics in the past, but these models are different from all of them. And so we wanted to understand them a bit better. So this I point I have already explained. Proportionate growth requires regulation and communication between different parts. Otherwise, you will not be able to ensure nearly proportionate growth. Okay? There is also another interesting point which is very surprising. It says same food becomes different tissues in different parts of the body. You eat some food. It's broken up into some components. All those chemical proteins, whatever, they go to the skin, they become skin cells. They go into the um, liver, they become liver cells. So the same food, depending on where it goes, it becomes different cells. Can I make a model which does this? Okay. And uh, the standard biological answer, they, if you talk to biologists, they say, oh, we understand growth, there is nothing to understand. Uh, they say that it occurs because of different chemical agents which achieve this. These are called growth factors, inhibitors, hormones. There is a hormone in, hormone growth factor called G18 which de determines the growth of the cells. And there is an inhibitor and there is a hormone called this which um, controls growth. That once they say this, then the whole problem is explained. There is nothing to explain further. And that is like if you go to a murder mystery and you say the knife did it. <coughs> it is true the knife did it. You know, we are not denying the fact that the knife did it. But there is more, we are looking for some structure beyond just the chemical agent which is doing the work. But the, the biological answer usually only worries about the agent, chemical agent. Once they identify the agent, their problem is solved. They don't look further. Okay, so this is the question. Can we find a simpler physical mathematical model that achieves this function, this, these three parts of the function, or two parts, and ignore chemical detail? We don't worry about all the different proteins and the DNAs which are there, which actually do all this stuff. Okay, so, okay, so this is growth phenomena in physics. These are different pictures of growth processes which have been studied in the past. So this one is a uh, copper leaves in zinc. So you have some zinc copper sulfate solution and you put in an um, electrode and pass current. Then the copper goes to the electrode and it forms these kinds of leaf-like structures. Okay, so this is called diffusion limited aggregation. And there is a lot of theory which deals with diffusion limited aggregation. It is well studied for last 30 years. This is a different phenomena. It is Epsom salt crystals grown from solution. Okay. So you just have solution, put in some Epsom salt, cool it down, then crystals grow. And then you break the top and take them out and this is the kind of structures you see. This is a different growth process which also has been studied, you know, this is the growth of snowflakes is sort of similar phenomena. And this last one is called an invasion percolation cluster. So you have some porous rock, you push in steam and see where it goes. And it goes into some shape like this. And the geometry of these structures is also studied a lot. So I looked quite hard, honestly, and I didn't come up with many processes which were different than all of these in some qualitative sense. Okay? So in all these cases, what happens is that the inner parts do not grow further. All the growth occurs on the outside and it just keeps on growing bigger and bigger. And the proportionate growth is qualitatively different because when the person becomes bigger, the heart also has to become bigger by the same fraction. So none of these previously studied models is doing that. And that's what we want to achieve. 
Okay, so then we wanted, so this was sort of one, this was the part dealing with growth, you know, so proportionate growth is different from all these other growths, that the, keep, that the bottom line. So now this is spatio-temporal patterns. So understanding pattern formation is very important, you know, there are these turbulent structures in fluids, snowflakes, continental drift, and they produce patterns some of which are very cute and you want to understand how they happen and some such thing. This is the large scale structure of the universe um, through the cosmic microwave background. You see a lot of interesting structure. <coughs> this is Rayleigh Bernard convection cells. You have liquid heated from below and it produces convection cells which are roughly hexagonal in shape. Here they put in small bit of very tiny aluminum particles which go round, but when they go round, they can, you can see them and this is a long exposure. So, you know, you can see the tracks of particles. So, the white color kind of tells you how the particles move in the convection cell. And these are drying mud patterns I showed you earlier also. You know, it's a fragmentation pattern, okay. Most of these are not very tractable analytically. You know, I can produce nice pictures, but can I produce a theory to produce these pictures? That is the question. Okay. Yes. It is because of something we don't understand very well. Yeah, that much is true. Yeah. Maybe um, the, um, the problem, the main problem is uh, lack of Markovian properties. Suppose it was non-Markovian with something, but it will still be not, it will, the insides will not grow, only growth will only occur at the surface. Yeah, but uh, if, um, if uh, the never forget if, uh, if. Yeah, it does not forget, uh, then what? I still do not get the kind of patterns I am looking for. I was trying to explain some physical problem I started with and putting in non-Markovian character or Markovian character is not enough. It may be needed, but it is not enough. DLA like starting point will not work, whatever you do, because it will not produce proportionate growth. It will not produce growth from inside. It will only produce growth on the outside. Yeah. Ah, yeah. And yeah, it has been studied. Internal and external. Yes. This oh, this one. Showed, uh, oh, this one we haven't come to, the previous one. Yes. These ones. Oh, the DLA can have lot of variations. I don't worry about that because for people have worked on it for thirty years. I'm sure there are several variations by now, but none of them produces proportionate growth. That much I'm sure of. It cannot because it's the, just the structure of the model is growth occurs on the outside. I don't worry about extra details. Okay, you can make the Walker non-Markovian. You can make them jump around from here to there. It will not produce proportionate growth still, whatever you do. Okay? All right. So, the fact that simple dynamical rules can generate complex patterns is very well known. It is not a new reason, phenomena we are discovering for the first time. So, it is well known. In the game of life, you can have this simple rule. There is a one dimensional line x i take value 0 and 1, at the next instant of time you take the two neighbors, add them mod 2, whatever you get is uh, your number and you just keep on evolving by this deterministic rule. The rule has been written down in one line. Then if you start with this initial condition with everything 0 with 1 1, which I denoted by a star, uh, then you produce a picture which looks somewhat complicated, 
it actually produces a Sierpinski gasket. You can check or you can prove. And you know, so it produces a somewhat more complex pattern from a very simple word. And um, so, for example, there is also this thing called Mendelbrot set, which people have seen, no doubt. It's also produced by simple equation, z prime equal to z squared plus c, and you see all kinds of complicated structures. So, however, in many of these cases, you can produce complex structures, but you cannot describe them well. Okay? So, for Mendelbrot set, I only see pictures. I think any more than pictures, one has not seen much. I think there is a proof somewhere that the fractal dimension is 2 or some such thing, which I don't know whatever it means. It doesn't tell me much about the shape of the Mendelbrot set. Okay? So, we will describe to you in the remaining 45 minutes, no, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, a simple, simple cellular automaton model which shows proportionate growth. It shows complex and beautiful patterns. It's exact, analytically tractable. And um, we will even study what happens if there is a little bit of noise added in the problem. So, the paper in the model is very straightforward. It is the sand pile model. You take the sand pile, start with everything with height 2 and add particle at the origin. Then there is some toppling, topple. Then add again at the origin, this toppling and uh, keep on toppling. And after you have added 10 to the power 4 particles at the origin, you look at what you have got. And this is the color plot of what you get by using. Uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 are denoted by red, blue, green, yellow. You get a picture. Then I add um, 200,000 particles, you get this picture, and 400,000 particles, you get this picture. And so it's easy to see that as you increase the number of particles added, the pattern grows, and it grows proportionately. That is a visual proof of the result. Okay. You can start with other beginning conditions. So, if you start with everything 0, then you get this picture. Uh, you can take some other um, background, other lattices. So, this is something called Manhattan lattice. Um, sorry, F lattice, alternate columns occupied 1, 0, 1, 0 stripe like initial condition and then you produce this kind of a picture. So, by varying the initial conditions bearing the lattice, you get different pictures, different models, but all of them seem to show proportionate growth. Okay, so that is something we would like to understand. Okay, yes. Yes, of course. Yes. No, this was not recurrent. You can start with everything zero. It, it, it does this. No, in this case, we are actually studying on an infinite lattice. On an infinite lattice outside the region affected, there are a lot of transient, the forbidden configurations. So, the notion of transient and recurrence is not useful because we never reach any recurrence. All of these configurations are transient. Once, they, once you add more particles, they disappear, they do not come up again. Okay? So, model. What is the model? We use only two basic facts from biology. One is that food is required for growth. If you do not get food, you do not grow. And the second is that the cell division is a threshold process. If there is a cell, you give it some food, it will not immediately break. Until it has enough size, it will not break into daughter cells. Okay? So, the, we use just this threshold. And then we, in our model, we say that once the nutrient at the site becomes at least four units, then the cell breaks into four parts and it goes to four neighbors. That's the model. Okay, so this is um, reduced to the well studied sand pile model. And this is repetition for you now. Non negative integers at zi at site i, there is a head rule, there is a relaxation rule. 
rule for forming pattern is, is, is that add n particles at one site on a periodic background and relax. So, these are deterministic patterns, there is no randomness in this. Next time you do this experiment, you will get the same picture. What we are looking for is this proportionate growth and characterizing the proportionate growth. Okay, so, this is sand pile model toppling rules, we can get rid of this one. So, key observations is that the diameter of the pattern you get will vary as root n. That is clear because there was some background, I kept on adding particles, outside they have not changed, all the particles inside have to be in the region which is affected by the toppling. But the maximum height inside is fixed to be 4. So, the area affected should increase linearly with n and so the diameter should increase as root n. Okay. The proportionate growth is observed, but it is uh, not so easy to explain. And then there is this extra result which was very surprising for us initially when we saw it. So, we looked at this picture and you look here and you look here and you look here. If you look here and zoom up this region, you find perfectly periodic structure. Okay. And then when you grow to a bigger size, the perfectly periodic structure just becomes bigger in size. Okay. So, uh, the perfectly periodic structure in each, well, this is what we call a patch and the big picture looks like made up of large number of patches which are sewn together to form a kilt. I guess that word is familiar to all of you. And Okay. Okay. So, examples of periodic patterns in patches, in some region you get this picture. You zoom up, it will be very big. If you make a big lattice, in some region you will get this picture. Perfectly periodic structures, in some region you get this. And the boundary of one region will be this picture and adjacent to this picture with some boundary separating them and so on. Okay, so, so simpler. So, we wanted to characterize this pattern, but we found that the square lattice pattern is not so easy to characterize. So, we went to something called the F lattice, which is very similar to the square lattice. At each side, you have two arrows in, two arrows out. And the rule is that when the height becomes more than two, two particles leave in the direction of outgoing arrows. <coughs> it's a directed sand pile as opposed to undirected sand pile. And then you get this picture, which is a bit easier to understand. What is so easy about this? Firstly, all the boundaries are straight lines. And there are only two types of patches, periodic patches. One patch is where everything is height 1. And there is a second type of patch, which is every, uh, alternate red and um, yellow, which looks orange here. Okay, so, there are two types of patches and they are arranged in this crazy way and can we understand this one? Sir, in this picture, yes. uh, there, are like, uh, thin, thin huh, there are thin lines. Yeah, these are called defect lines and they are there and mm, the size of these lines is kind of small, but they are important. As you grow the thing, they move and uh, that is what leads to growth. That is a feature which we are not addressing just now. We will ignore these transient lines in this first description. So, some characterization may be extended to other backgrounds, exactly same pattern found in. So, this was a different lattice. I showed you the Manhattan, uh, sorry, I showed you the F lattice, where at each side you had two arrows in, two arrows out, but we constructed a different lattice called the Manhattan lattice where there is a whole row thing going up, whole row thing going down, up, down, up, down and then left, right, left, right, left, right. It is a different set of arrows than the original one, but you grow it on this new lattice, you get the same picture. So, even using different lattices, you get the same pattern. So, the pattern does not depend on the lattice so much, of course, it depends on the lattice, but not so much. Okay, and uh, so, okay. 
So, this is the Manhattan lattice with density half, this is with density 5 by 8 and they produce same picture. And then we, so we were showing these pictures to biology friends and they said, oh, you, uh, you have these models, but you know, this is not at all biological because in biology there is noise and your model has no noise. Deterministic cellular automaton models, who cares? We are not interested. So, <laughs> so we said, okay, we will put in noise. So what we did was we put in 1 percent noise. <coughs> This pattern is grown on 0101 checkerboard background, but we take 1 percent of the sites and they change their height from 1 to 0. So, it is on a random background, noisy background and you still get the same picture. The overall structure of the picture remains the same. Uh, you can see the details of some complications and then you make 10 percent noise, then the picture looks like that. It has changed. The pattern is not identical to the, you know, these two pictures are not identical, but at least the gross features remain the same. There are eight petals on the outside and then there is a new next layer of 16 petals and so on and so forth, right. So some uh, robustness in the pattern is there even if the details of the <coughs> patterns are not identical. So, this is the same picture, but now we said 1 can become 0, but 0 can also become 1 with some probability. Yes, please. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Ah, yeah, of course. No, I am not claiming that all noise will be pre preserve the pattern, but at least for some classes of noise, the pattern is preserved. The pattern does not disappear as soon as you add the littlest bit of noise. There is a degree of robustness. It is not perfectly robust to all perturbations. You can imagine some kind of noise which will kill the pattern, okay. That is not a problem. But at least there are some kinds of noise which are which are not killing the pattern. I am in, interested in explaining that part. The part where the noise kills the pattern, I do not care, no, that is less interesting for me. Okay. So, here what we did was we added 1 to 0 and then you see a slightly different picture. What is difference between this picture and this picture? Here you have this pattern here, where there is some density here and there is a different density here. And these two patches have a boundary which is fairly sharp. In the new picture, the boundary is not so sharp, it has become fuzzy. But still there is a density difference between the different parts of the stuff. So the pattern is there to that degree, but it does not have sharp boundaries anymore. Okay. Ah, so this, yes please. What was the difference in the noise uh, from the previous uh, picture? Yeah. The first one and the second, this one and the previous one. So in the previous one what we did was we changed 1 to 0, but here we also changed 0 to 1. Okay, so it is a diff slightly different type of noise and it has a slightly different effect. So these simple rules give rise to patterns that are unexpectedly true to life. So, what I was doing was I was preparing a talk. So, I went to the downstairs <coughs> garden and I took out a picture of a flower. This is a real picture of a real flower. And then we were trying to make a model with a picture like this from my sand pile models which looks like this. So, if you take a background in which the background has some different shape, then you get a picture like this. And the size of these leaves can be adjusted by changing the density of the background or changing the periodicity of the background and stuff like this. So, I was adjusting the length of the petals to match this one. We got it. These are roughly the same. But in addition, 
you get surprisingly this funny stuff, um, which are like these ones, and you get this Corolla, which is like this one, and I swear it, we didn't put it in, it just comes out by itself. Okay? So, the model is of course very simple, but um, it seems to have some properties which occur in the real problem which have been kept which gives rise to these structures. Okay? So, then one should understand them better, that is the statement. So, we were very ambitious, we said, oh, we can also produce directed sand piles, you know, I like directed sand piles. So, this is a model in which um, once a toppling occurs, it sends a particle up and down and right, but nothing to the left. So, then it produces a picture like this. We said this is called the larva pattern because it, you know, this is the mouth where you put in add particles, the food comes from there and it grows to the right. Okay? And uh, then you look at the picture, oh, it seems you know, there is the tail region, there is a head region, there is a thorax, qualitatively. Okay? So, Growing sand pile patterns give simple models showing complex patterns and proportionate growth. In some cases, we can exactly characterize the limiting pattern, only in a limited number of cases, and uh, it has robustness to the initial background. And uh, that is uh, what there is, but I still have 10 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, these are the references. Uh, there is an article in Current Science which is available on the internet. You just type Current Science and you will get it free. You don't have to subscribe. And there is a model in JSTAT. Uh, sorry, there is a paper in JSTAT which has appeared um, by now. And, and then I was just want to expose a little bit to the mathematics involved in understanding this, which we didn't emphasize. I looked at the pictures, they are easier to explain than the mathematics, but there is this stuff called complex numbers and there are things called analytic functions of complex numbers and they are very nice structure and you already had a whole course on this conformal field theory which deals with the analytic functions of complex numbers. You know, it depends on the fact that the complex, analytic functions of complex numbers have a lot of structure, okay. But suppose you have a problem which is defined only on integer points on a lattice then can we have any no so the numbers are m plus i n where m and n are integers. You can define a function on this set of points, but then can I use the theory of analytic functions for these functions. So, it turns out surprisingly, it is not very obvious, but it is true that you can have something called discrete analytic functions. The discrete analytic functions are the functions which satisfy this discrete Cauchy Riemann condition, which is that you go to a site and uh, you calculate the derivative of the function by taking a finite difference in this direction 1, 2, 3, one, z1 one minus z, fz1 minus fz3 by z1 minus z3 is the derivative of f. But if this derivative is equal to the derivative calculated from the x direction for all points, then this function is said set to satisfy discrete analytic, discrete Cauchy Riemann conditions, and it is said to be discrete analytic. So, these functions have nice properties. Firstly, this, all the functions satisfy discrete Laplace's equation, but you have all mm, other structures like sums of discrete functions are also discrete analytic functions, but product of discrete analytic functions are not discrete analytic. So, you have to work harder. But once you have the discrete analytic function, they can be used to explain the patterns one sees in this problem. So, this is the explanation of that part, uh, could uh, just written like that, I do not want to explain this. It says, we find the coefficient of the linear term in, uh, it is too, too hard to explain, I will not do it, my time is limited. So, if you want to characterize the pattern, then it turns out that it can be expressed in terms of these discrete analytic functions. You know, so, so, so for some other problem, we found that the solution is an airy function. 
what is an airy function is the solution of that differential equation. Okay. In our case, the solution is expressed in terms of discrete analytic functions. So, it um, provides me um, because there is some stuff known about discrete analytic functions, I can use the existing theory about this. That is all I need to say. Uh, so, these conditions determine the pattern completely. If you sort of say that my pattern is a discrete analytic function, then in some sense you completely characterize the pattern. Now, of course, you have to work hard, it is not so trivial. But just like if I say that the, um, there is conformal symmetry, then I get a lot of, you know, I say, oh, but the, this exponent must be 1 by 8, this exponent must be 1 by 7 by 12 or whatever. Similarly, if you impose these kinds of conditions on the patterns, then you can characterize them with some work. Okay, so, there is another thing called tropical mathematics, 5 minutes only, which I would like to explain. So, tropical mathematics is a very interesting branch of mathematics, where what they said was that, suppose I take a new definition, I have real numbers A and B, but I, I define something called A plus B equal to maximum of A and B and I define A times B is equal to A plus B. Okay? These are some strange definitions of addition and multiplication. But if you use these definitions, then the addition is um, commutative and this multiplication, addition is distributive over multiplication and all the rules of algebra work. Okay? So, you can do all the mathematics with this new interpretation of plus and multiplication. Okay? So, that provides very interesting new structures. For example, there is a famous, um, uh, let us see. So, standard properties of uh, usual addition and multiplication continue to hold that if you add, you know, associative property, you first add these numbers, then you add this to that, or you first add this to, then add that one, that will still give you the same answer. Uh, and there is a fundamental theorem of tropical algebra. You can multiply numbers, you can define polynomials, okay? And then there is a fundamental theorem of tropical algebra, is that a tropical polynomial can be always written as a product of linear factors, which is an extension of the famous fundamental theorem of algebra that every polynomial can be written as a product of factors. Okay? So, sometimes by realizing that, oh, but I, I, I can think of the multiplication in this way, that gives me new <coughs> insight into the problem. Okay? So, anyway, the mathematician studied this uh, tropical algebra. Uh, actually, a lot of people in Brazil studied this in the beginning. And uh, some of the other people were making jokes about it. this is the kind of mathematics which people in the developing countries do. That is the origin of the word tropical algebra. It's the kind of algebra which people in tropics study. Okay? Actually, they were respectful and they were making a joke. But anyway, this name was given by French mathematicians. <laughs> okay. So, in my case, uh, the statement is a piecewise linear convex function can be represented as a tropical polynomial. I do not know what this means, but uh, some, if you have a piecewise convex function, you can write a tropical polynomial which will be the graph. This piecewise constant function will be the graph of the polynomial. And then, um, if you take these growing sand piles and you draw the toppling function, which is the number of topplings which occur at site x as a function of number of particles added. This function in the large n limit seems to be a tropical polynomial. So, that is the reason why the tropical polynomials are presumably interesting for the study of sand piles. Uh, so, I think this is the most interesting ap physical application of tropical algebra because people have studied it in the past, but it was a very um, unmotivated exercise, I think. 
and uh, we are starting with a model we want to understand and this uh, algebra just seems to be showing up which is useful for understanding and hence one studies it further. So that is a different motivation. Uh, then studying um, the problem from purely mathematical angle. Okay, I think that is all there is. So I will stop here and uh,